Well, good morning again, and welcome here this morning. I hope you uh, took some time to really think about the words that you were singing this morning and um, what, what truths we are proclaiming. You know, that God is God, and He's in control of all things. So in the second song, we, we see that God is going to bring a kingdom, and uh, we saw that in the first song. And because of that, because of who He is and what He's done for us, we can praise Him. And our lives ought to be a, that, that song of praise at, at all times. And so, um, and I think that really fits well with what we are going through in the book of Daniel here um, last week and this morning. That we are going to continue to see um, God work in that way. Do you... Uh, do you ever read a newspaper? I know that's maybe old school for uh, for you. Or uh, look at your phone and read the uh, pick your favorite news app to uh, to keep you up to date. And when you do that, are you ever tempted to wonder um, if God really knows what's going on down here? That uh, as you swipe through and see what's going on in the world, in our community, and just with people in general, the, the temptation may be that, wow, man, how can that be happening if God's really in control? And from a human standpoint, I will admit, it often looks like the inmates are running the asylum, right? <laughs> that, uh, that things are just out of control. But fortunately, we know from Scripture that, that God knows what is going on and is firmly in control. Isaiah says in uh, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, For I am God, there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, My counsel will be established, and I will accomplish my good pleasure. It's interesting that Isaiah wrote this about a hundred years before where we are in the book of Daniel, and he's actually prophesying, God is sharing a message with him, prophesying that the Babylonians are going to come and uh, be in control of Jerusalem. And so we see God saying that in regard to what we are actually going to be looking at today. So today I hope to be able to demonstrate you from our study of Daniel's account how much God knows and how much he is in control. Just by way of review, last week uh, I just introduced a little bit more about the book of Daniel, the fact that the book of Daniel is primarily history and prophecy. About half of the book is history, and um, we work through those in chapters 1 through 6. And about half of the book is prophecy, and we work through that in chapters 7 through 12. The history builds on itself, as we will see, and the prophecy builds on itself, as we will see this morning. Now, chapter 2, I said first half is primarily prophecy. Well, chapter 2 is about half history and half prophecy. And so we're going to spend some time this morning digging into some, some prophecy. We did find ourselves in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, right? And we said 602 B.C. We got to uh, see a few different responses to stress last week that God brought into people's lives through, uh, through the activities that are going on. We found Nebuchadnezzar stressed because he was having a dream that troubled him and he was losing sleep over it. And what did he do? He responded by pulling on his worldly wisdom. Go get the wise men. They can tell me what's going on and res resolve this for me. And then when they can't, he threatens and bribes them trying to use his power and worldly wealth to bring about a resolution to this issue that he has. And finally he ends up issuing a decree, right? He goes, well, you can't do this, so just kill them all. 
That's a good idea. That'll make me feel a lot better. So, um, so we saw Nebuchadnezzar pull on all of his earthly resources in an attempt to resolve this stress that God brought into his life. And, and we saw that he couldn't. It didn't. And then we found the wise men stressed because of Nebuchadnezzar's request, right? What did he ask? He said, tell me the dream and its interpretation. And what do they do? They ask for information. They go, hey, tell us the dream and then we'll give you the interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar says, no, I'm not going to do that. And they go, well, no, tell us the dream and it's in, we will interpret it for you. And so their stress is rising because Nebuchadnezzar is firm in his resolve for them to relate all of this back to him. They disparage, they whine, they complain, right? No great king or powerful ruler has ever asked about a matter like this we see in verse 12. And they finally acknowledge that their supposed skills and abilities to be in touch with the gods are false. And they confess their fraud out loud. They are stressed because now they're under the sentence of death. And then we find Daniel, Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah under the very real threat of execution as part of this group of, as, as them being part of this group of wise men. Even though they weren't in the courtroom activity and didn't get a chance to say, hey, maybe we can do this. However, they respond in a godly way in the face of this stress that has been brought upon them. They utilize the talents and the gifts that God has given them. They act with discretion and discernment with both Ariok, the executioner that's coming to take them away, and then when given the opportunity with Nebuchadnezzar, uh, they go into his court and um, ask for some time. Say, hey, we weren't here the first time you asked for this. Give us the opportunity to respond. And then what do they do? They seek God's compassion. They pray. They don't run around in a, in a panic, hoping that things get better or trying to pull on their worldly um, resources to bring about a resolution, but they seek God's compassion. And then when God responds, they do the only thing that they can. They praise Him. They praise Him. And so, um, that was where we left off last week, and so this week we're going to pick up and we're going to take a look at Daniel's declaration to the king after all of this has transpired. So let me read uh, chapter 2, verses 25 to 30. Then Arioch hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence and spoke to him as follows. I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can make the interpretation known to the king. The king said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered before the king and said, As for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while on your bed. As for you, O king, while on your bed, your thoughts turn to what will take place in the future, and he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than in any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. So here Daniel comes in and makes uh, several declarations before the king. First off, let's note that Arioch He's, uh, he seems to be relieved and maybe even a little bit excited that there is somebody that can address the king's request. 
He obviously stays the king's execution order, particularly here with Daniel and friends, and I believe with others as well. And he hurriedly takes Daniel into the king. Now, he goes, hey, I found, look what I found, right? Somebody that can satisfy your request. That may be a little bit self-serving. And maybe he's thinking about the rewards and glory that uh, Nebuchadnezzar has promised to whoever it is that can, can bring about this, the explanation of this dream that he's been having. And so it, maybe he's looking for a finder's fee, right? But notice he says only that Daniel can interpret the dream. So the first thing that Nebuchadnezzar does is ask a question. He says, can you tell me the dream and its interpretation? I imagine that Nebuchadnezzar here is still a little suspicious, as we saw in verses 8 and 9. Um, the fact that the wise men were buying time and that they had agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words to him. So this is probably still fresh in his mind. And he may also be remembering the early response of the other wise men who said, there is no one else who could do this. And so when Ariok comes in and says, hey, I found somebody that can interpret the dream, and Nebuchadnezzar's first question is, well, can he tell me the dream and its interpretation? But there also may be a bit of a twinge of hope here on Nebuchadnezzar's part. Because remember, he gave Daniel some time, and as we talked about last week, I believe he is still hoping to get a resolution to this stress of, that he's under of not knowing about this dream. And so in that light, Daniel makes some strong declarations here. He sets the stage to make God known to Nebuchadnezzar and the court, so share the gospel of the day, if you will, and see God glorified. His first, he first declares, as for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. Now think about the audience. Ariok's probably clinching up here a little bit because, ooh, I said somebody could uh, explain this. And Daniel just said, hey, there's nobody that can do this. Nebuchadnezzar probably begins to feel his worst suspicions are confirmed that Daniel and, and his friends are just buying time here and trying to play the odds that I'm going to change my mind. If the other wise men happen to be around, they're probably thinking, uh-oh, this isn't good for us. But think about it. Now Daniel has everybody's attention. And so... He, uh, he quickly follows up with a however. And so Daniel next declares, However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the last days. So Daniel declares, Hey, there is a God. And as opposed to what the wise men said before, he interacts with people. And it's he, not me, who has revealed the king's dream and its interpretation. He is the one who's going to tell you the future. Again, we have seen Daniel respond with discretion and discernment before. And here we see Daniel respond in extreme humility in the fact that this isn't me, and, and we'll see it later. This is God making himself known to you. And then Daniel declares that God knows Nebuchadnezzar. In verse 29 he says, O king, while on your bed your thoughts turn to what would happen in the future, and he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will happen. Think about it. Nebuchadnezzar's not praying to God, asking for him to reveal this, this dream to him or to explain this dream to him. This is God acting on his own. God knows what Nebuchadnezzar is pondering. God knows what Nebuchadnezzar is troubled by. God chose to reveal to him the plan in response to the king's musings about what would take place in the future. What a privileged position Nebuchadnezzar finds himself. 
for God to reveal to mankind, to an unbeliever to boot, his plan for the rest of world history? What a privilege. So there's a little bit of a takeaway here, right? Do you ever really wonder if God knows what's going on with you? Whether, whether you are His or not? This is a clear example in Scripture that God knows you intimately. He knows where you are, right? He, he even, Daniel even says, hey, while you're thinking about this on your bed, right? So God knows where you are. He knows your thoughts. He knows your ponderings. He knows your confusions. He knows your struggles. He can satisfy those by us either asking them directly, as Daniel and his friends did, or maybe just in his grace and mercy, he may choose to give you the answer without asking in order to fulfill his plan, both for your life and for the people around you. Now, this should be frightening to us, right? We are called to fear God. God knows us this intimately. He knows our thoughts. He knows our struggles. He knows where we are and what we are up to. Frightening, but also a great encouragement because God does know all of those things. And because He cares for us, He does respond and act on them. Again, Daniel declares also his own humility again. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than any other living man, but for the purpose of making known the interpretation to the king, and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. Think about it. what a great what a great opportunity this would be for Daniel for self promotion. Right? Hey, I've been working in the mailroom. Maybe you can pull me up and, uh, and help me do better here. But instead, Daniel de declares, Hey, I am not God. I'm no wiser than any other man. And I didn't do this. It is God who is great. And I'm just His instrument to re reveal Him to you, Nebuchadnezzar, and to let you know what his plan happens to be. God is using Daniel and his friends through their reliance on God in response to his testing to reveal himself to the elites of the world. Think about it. This is the king of the world. I'm the king of the world. Um, Nebuchadnezzar. And, and Daniel has a pulpit in front of him. And he declares the God of the universe. Daniel has a pulpit in front of the wise men and declares the God of the universe. So we see that God continues to work his plan for the good of his people by making himself known to the authorities that are over them. So let's look at the dream recounted. And so Daniel is now going to share the dream with Nebuchadnezzar and with the people in court there. And I'll just read 31 to 35. It says, You, O king, are looking, and behold, there was a, a, a single great statue. That statue, which was large and, large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, and its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed, all at the same time, because, and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. I'm going to move relatively quickly here because this is just Daniel recounting what Nebuchadnezzar has, has seen. 
But don't worry, we'll get to the meaning of it here momentarily. So what was it that Nebuchadnezzar did see in his dream? He sees a statue standing in front of him. It's huge. It's dazzling. Think of polished metal in bright sunlight, right? And then it is awesome. And the, the root word for awesome here is to fear. So this is a fearful statue that is standing in front of Nebuchadnezzar. We're told that the statue is composed of various materials. That the head is of gold. That the chest and arms are of silver. The abdomen and thighs are, are bronze. The legs are iron and then the feet and the toes are of iron mixed with clay. The statue is then destroyed. This awesome, amazing, huge statue, statue is destroyed by a stone. Daniel notes that it's a stone that is cut out without hands and it strikes the statue on its feet. The statue is smashed to dust all at once apparently and the dust is blown away so much so that Daniel says there is not a trace of them to be found. And the statue is replaced by a mountain. The striking stone grows to become a great mountain replacing the statue. And it fills the whole earth. So, what does all this mean anyway? And how do we gain an understanding of its meaning? So, for that, let me digress here for a moment and talk a little bit about how we are going to do interpretation <coughs> through the book of Daniel. If somebody asked you, how, do, how does your church interpret the Bible? What would your answer be? You know, how, how do you approach the scripture and um, how do you figure out what it means? Well, I believe he, we would say here at uh, Mission Community that we interpret the Bible literally. And that you can just answer that way. Well, we interpret the Bible literally. And they go, well, well, what is that? Well, first off, let's talk about what is interpretation. Simply understood Interpretation is just understanding the intended meaning of the author. One commentator said it this way. I like to refer to the step of interpretation as the recreation process. We're attempting to stand in the author's shoes and recreate his experience. To think as he thought, to feel as he felt, and to decide as he decided. We're asking, what did this mean to him? before we ever ask, what does it mean to us? So with that thought, with the thought of this being interpretation is just understanding the intended meaning of the author, well, where does that leave us with how many correct interpretations there are of a passage? Well, the answer is there's only one. And um, there may, though, be many applications to that one interpretation. So you go, okay, well, if there's only one interpretation, why when I go listen to uh, preaching on the radio or go to a different church, I hear something different? Why is that? Well, it's because we're fallible. We don't have perfect knowledge, and um, so we may get it wrong. Other things, we may use interpretation as uh, to make a passage say what we want it to say, to justify our position, to proof text, right? Or we may feel like, oh wow, that's unfair as we're reading through this, or, or that is unjust. You mean God really chooses whom he will? That people are condemned to hell? That men and women have different roles within the church and within the family? Man, that's just not fair. Or maybe we think, oh, we've got more better understanding than Daniel or those guys in history, right? We've got science. And science has shown we've got biology, we've got psychology, we've got more physics and math than those guys ever had at their fingertips. But, you know, the writers were just ignorant, so what they wrote was, it was just wrong. 
We apply our human situation and wisdom to try to explain God. And we don't or we won't do the hard work to truly understand. So why is interpretation such hard work? Well, think about it. A lot has changed in the last 2,100 to 6,000 years, which is what we have here in the scriptures before us. There are changes of language. There's translational difficulties. Word meanings change with time. There are changes of culture. Remember, we're trying to figure out what the author intended, and so um, the culture has changed. Think about places in scripture where you think, oh, well, put your hand to the plow. Well, what does that mean? How does that look? Or, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, I don't see very many shepherds around these days. What does that mean? Or, put burning coals on his head. Good grief, what does that mean? And so, trying to think through the cultural things and understand what is going on in the culture can help us understand what's going on in Scripture. There's also not learning or understanding the literary types that we might have before us. You know, there's just narrative history, just somebody recounting accounts that, that happened. There's poetry, there's parables, there's wisdom literature. And beyond that, we just in our fallenness have communication barriers. Just think about as you talk to people. What, what you are hearing and what they are saying just don't ever match up. You come at it this way. And, uh, and that's just because of our fallenness. Okay, so interpretation is tough and it's hard work. So what do we say when we are going to interpret literally? So if interpretation is understanding the meanings and the intent of the author, then literal interpretation is strictly understanding the meaning intended by the author by using the ordinary principles that one use uses to understand anything written. And this is done through a process that we call or is often referred to as hermeneutics. Well, that's a big word. What does that mean? Well, the New Bible Dictionary defines it this way. It says it's the study and statement of principles on which a text is to be understood. Webster says it this way. The study of the methodological principles of interpretation. So hermeneutics is just the standard things that you do, the processes that you use to figure out what a text means. If you get a letter from somebody and you read it or you read an article in the paper, you apply some certain things to figure out what that means. The word hermeneutics actually comes from the Greek word hermeneuo, and it, it just denotes to explain. And it's used of the explaining of the meanings of words in a different language. In John 1, 38, we see, turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi. And John tells us, which means teacher, right? So John is interpreting for us uh, what the people are saying, that they are calling Jesus rabbi. Well, what does that mean? It means teacher. There's also a, a strengthened form of this, which is dire menuo, and um, it's to interpret or to explain fully. And we see Christ doing this in Luke 24, 27. He says, And beginning with, the Mo with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures 